am i aware uh, sir we are live now okay great so uh, it's an honor to welcome professor raman sukumar from iic bangalore so uh, we are grateful to him for having accepted our request to deliver this insa lecture a special lecture we have two lectures each section every year so this year the first lecture is being delivered by raman sukumar as you can see on the desh and elf in the anthropocene uh, just to you know he is known to everybody so i don't know but uh, just to say that anthropocene or should we call it coronocene i don't know but yeah the coronocene has begun i will leave it to him uh, thank you professor uh, sukumar so please uh, the, the floor is yours completely uh, okay go ahead thank you thank you uh, thank you professor pandit and uh, it's an honor for me to have been invited by insa to uh, deliver this lecture um, i think uh, you know the opening slide uh, with the elephant this is a wild elephant by the way in uh, state of west bengal and what it is doing in terms of rans ransacking a bus uh, kind of explains the real dilemma that we face today or the elephant faces today and humans face today in the age of the anthropocene and how do we deal with uh, this kind of an interaction or conflict okay now the uh, when you look at the evolution of elephants of the modern day elephants this is a story that goes back uh, about 60 million years and it goes back to very small creatures uh, such as meritherium uh, uh and uh, you know there are probably even further ancestral forms called erythrium and so on and uh, these creatures start appearing uh, not long after the exit of the dinosaurs the dinosaurs were of course uh, reptiles they were gigantic creatures and uh, possibly an asteroid collision uh, you know caused their extinction but soon after that uh, you know when when i say soon a few million years after that you know the mammals uh, you know uh, started emerging uh, radiating and so on and it's a 60 million year story and of course uh, the ancestral forms of these proboscideans were very very small they were not uh, uh, small, higher uh, so larger than the size of a of a pig or so but today of course the most outstanding feature of uh, the elephant is the body size you know uh, and um, a full grown male elephant can weigh 5000 kilos uh, which is about 100 times that of the weight of an average uh, human being and of course uh, the other characteristic feature of the elephant is its proboscis which aids in food acquisition now a lot has been written about the enormous quantities of food required by an elephant you know uh, you go to the you know the generally the popular media and uh, you know even some of the scientific articles that come out uh, and so on they say you know elephant is very large it needs a lot of space it needs a lot of food yes certainly if you look at an adult male elephant it needs about 300 kilos fresh weight fodder plant material every day and this is kind of typical for a big male and of course it's smaller for uh, you know for females and other younger younger elephants in the family group however one uh, point that is missed is that the quantity is not large when related to its body size and uh, let me explain this uh, uh, you know when you look at the metabolic rate of an elephant and uh, or if you look at uh, the basal metabolic rate and body size across mammals you see that the you know uh, the elephants is actually has a very very uh, low metabolic rate compared to you know mice or shrew and so on you know because the elephant has a, a relatively small uh, you know uh, surface to body ratio and therefore in uh, terms of its body weight what an elephant needs is only a small percentage of its body weight it eats only about 10% or 8% fresh fodder every day in, in terms of its body weight as compared to you know many of the smaller mammals require an equal uh, you know amount of fodder as their body weight but nevertheless the quantities are large and therefore to meet their food requirements elephants eat almost anything elephants will feed on grass you're familiar with it on the right side you see elephants feeding on palm uh, on the top on the bottom left you see an elephant uh, stripping the bark of a tree and feeding on it and at the bottom right you see an elephant pulling out the root of a plant and feeding on it so you name it you know practically any plant part is something that is uh, can be consumed by an elephant i don't mean all plants species but a variety of plant uh, parts and of course they even feed on fruits and they get drunk in the process this is a marula tree an african elephant is uh, shaking the tree it feeds on this when it's overripe and the fruit ferments in its uh, digestive system and the elephant gets quite drunk you know much like the humans 
Now, one, uh, 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 I wouldn't say this is a new trend, but it's a rather disturbing trend. And uh, I'll explain later what I mean by disturbing trend is that there is elephants also come out and raid crops. They raid cultivated crops, say paddy, sugarcane, banana, a whole range of different species. And uh, this is becoming especially common in the Anthropocene. And I would say in the last 20 or 30 years, it's, uh, this is a, a phenomenon that has become extremely common. So this poses, uh, you know, uh, serious uh, challenges in terms of management and conservation of the species, because elephants come into conflict uh, with humans in the process. So I'm going to take you on a kind of a short journey in terms of looking at elephant diets over time and uh, sort of uh, both, uh, you know, ancestral elephants bringing you up to the present uh, uh, time periods and then try to give you some insights, insights as to why do elephants raid crops and why do they come into conflict with people. I mean, for me personally, as a scientist, uh, this journey began about 40 years ago. When I was trying to look at the question of uh, when I started my research on elephants, I was asking the question as uh, are Asian elephants browsers or are they grazers? Okay, now browsing means feeding on shrubs and trees and all the rest of it and grazer of course means feeding on grass. And uh, uh, fundamental understanding of the feeding requirements of a large mammalian herbivore is important for conservation, both, I mean, both from a scientific angle, as well as for us to manage its conservation. Like we know that rhinoceros in India requires grassland. Okay. And if you take a, a giraffe in Africa, it requires browse, or it requires uh, trees and shrubs uh, to feed. But on the, uh, on the other hand, with Asian elephants, you know, at that time, the uh, literature was not, uh, there was not much literature, it was quite unclear. A study in Sri Lanka concluded that Asian elephants in Sri Lanka ate mostly grass. And that's true if you look at the elephants in the foreground. But look at the background and look at the forest there. Okay, and these elephants also move into the forest. And it is much more difficult to observe elephants inside dense forests. And I soon realized 40 years ago that very often the observers would park themselves up, you know, out in an open area in a grassland where elephants come out into the open. And um, therefore, it's much easy, you know, it's quite easy to observe them, to observe their behavior, their feeding. And what do they feed when they are in a grassland? They feed on grass. <laughs> but nobody follows them inside the jungle, inside dense forest. It is risky, it's dangerous, it's difficult, but they feed on a variety of different plant parts, you know, bamboos and bark and fruits and leaves and so on, but they are inside the forest. So I was trying to research this question and I stumbled upon a, a method known as a stable isotope method, which I will come. But in the meanwhile, let me just put up uh, some uh, a summary of some of the observational studies. On elephants. You know, we can make an inference about the elephant feeding preferences from looking at elephants, watching them, seeing what they eat, you know, trying to do sampling of their feeding habits. So there's my own study that was conducted in the 1980s, where I kind of uh, came to the conclusion that uh, uh, there is seasonal difference between the amount of braze, uh, browsing, that is C3 plants, plants with C3 photosynthesis and C4 plants, or plants with C4 uh, photosynthetic pathway, you know, depending on the season, dry season, the uh, southwest monsoon, the northeast monsoon. But overall, it's a very mixed kind of a picture. They feed on both browse and grass. A couple of other studies later on said that elephants is mainly a grazer, but I believe that there are inherent biases in the observations that uh, people make. And therefore, uh, in, my, in my early study, I chanced upon this method in by which you can trace the diet of a, of a herbivorous mammal by looking at the ratio of 13 carbon to 12 carbon in an organic tissue, such as collagen, bone collagen. Uh, now the bone collagen, um, the amino acids come from, uh, you know, the plant sources. And you know that uh, the plant sources can either be C3 or C4. Essentially, the C3 plants are the majority of trees, shrubs and herbs and the C4 plants are the tropical grasses. And they have very different ratios of 13 to 12 carbon. And therefore, uh, this would be reflected, you know, in the organic tissues that you measure. Okay, now over a period of time, I kind of summarized all of this. Uh, there were several papers and I summarized all of this in a book. And the pattern was very, very interesting. When you look at both African elephants and Asian elephants, the number of studies are fewer for, for Asian elephants, but a lot of studies on African elephants. If you look at all of, all of this and we look at carbon isotope ratios, the conclusion is 
that elephants can be pure browsers, that is feeding only on C3 plants. You know, you go to dense rainforest, they feed only on C3 plants. But if you go to the savanna woodlands, like you go to East Africa, or you come to the Nilgiris, you come to places like Mundumalaya and Bandipur and so on, they are mixed feeders, they feed on C3 and they feed on C4. But there is not a single elephant population that depends entirely on grass, on C4 plants. That is the story that is told by the isotope ratio, the stable isotope record. This is the story that he told us. And therefore, uh, uh, and in my own study in Southern India, I found that 70% of the organic carbon for the elephants came from browse or the C3 plants. And therefore, uh, I concluded that, uh, you know, forest is important for elephants, browse rich forests. So forests that provide bark and uh, fruits and leaves and a whole variety of other kinds of plant parts, not just the grassland or grasses or whatever. Uh, but, you know, so this is very important for the survival of elephants. And um, therefore, we need to preserve forest for elephants. And even today, you'll find these arguments that we need to have forests for Asian elephants to survive. But, you know, more recently, I've been questioning this, uh, this assumption. And uh, so I asked this question, is it correct or not? Now, let me take you on an evolutionary, uh, 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 you know, a kind of a, a journey on the dietary trends in uh, ancestral elephants right up to the present day modern elephant, which is Elephas maximus. So this is a very recent work published uh, by us in collaboration with Rajiv Patnaik of Punjab University. And uh, this tells a, a story over the last 14 million years, okay, 14 million years of elephant evolution or uh, more broadly proboscidean evolution, which is more correct. The elephant, uh, the term elephant refers only to the elephant family, which is the Asian elephant, the African elephant and the mammoth, strictly speaking, but more broadly the proboscidean evolution. So if you look at it, uh, if you look at the evolution, uh, you know, the y-axis is the uh, is the age in million years, uh, and uh, the x-axis is the delta 13c values, that is the, the carbon isotope ratio. These are all based on tooth enamel and not on bone collagen, so uh, don't, uh, don't look at the numbers very much. But the dark green, you know, if you look at between about 14 million and about 7 million years before present, all these ancestral elephant forms were essentially browsers. They fed on C3 plants. Then in the Miocene, about 7 million years ago, now there is a trend that elephants now increase the proportion of C4 plants or the grasses in the diet, the ancestral elephants. So a number of different forms are there, Elephas planiforms, Anancas, and, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. You know, the, uh, you know, the uh, legend is given here, but you get a very clear trend towards grasses. And this is consistent with what we know in terms of climate change, in terms of during the Miocene, you had uh, a lower atmospheric uh, CO2 than what we have today. We have faced with increasing atmospheric CO2 and the greenhouse effect. You had a reverse greenhouse effect during the Miocene around 7 million years ago. And therefore, you had an expansion of uh, C4 plants or the grasses during, the, during that period. And therefore, the uh, mammalian herbivores also uh, adapted, adapted themselves to feeding on grass. So you get a trend towards a C4 diet. And then very strangely, if you come towards more recent times, there is once again a trend back towards the C3, which I will examine a little more closely. Now, this dietary, dietary trend is accompanied by morphological changes in the dental, in the dental apparatus of these mammalian herbivores. So this is a gentle, gentle figure for all mammalian herbivores. You see, if you look at the central figure, okay, I don't want you to ignore, you know, all, all the rest of it. But look at this green uh, curve here. This is a very, very, this is an oxygen isotope ratio, which is an indication of temperature. Now, the world, the Earth has actually been cooling over time. We have global warming very, very recently in the Anthropocene. But the overall trend over the past several million years or tens of millions of years is actually a, a global cooling trend. Okay. And along with that, the dental characters changed into hypsodont teeth, hypsodon tooth. That is, the teeth, teeth become, uh, you know, the crowns of the teeth become larger and larger to allow the animals to uh, cope with a very abrasive diet of grass. And when you look at the elephant diet, once again, I put the same figure on the left. You look at the hypsodont index, you know, the, the teeth become of the molars of the elephant 
become larger, higher and higher, the high ground. They become more hypsodont over time in adaptation to a grazing diet. And if you look at the number of lamellae, the number of plates per teeth, they also increase. All this helps the proboscidean uh, herbivore, uh, evolving herbivore in relation to a natural climate change to feed on grass more and more over these you know, uh, you know, several million years before present. Now, when you look at African elephant, this is lots around Africa. Now, you look at Elfas maximus, straight away you will see that the number of plates of the lamella in African elephant is much fewer than that of the Asian elephant. The Asian elephant is thinner uh, lamellae and they are more plentiful and they are very comparable to the mammoth. So, the Elephas maximus is adapted more to a grazing diet and the mammoth, of course, became extinct. Now, about starting from about two and a half million years ago, we had the, uh, the Pleistocene period. We were, the earth has undergone the glacial and interglacial cycles. During glacial times, which lasts typically about, you know, anywhere between 60 and 90,000 years, the earth has been much colder than what it is today. And then there are these brief episodes of warming, maybe lasting 10 or 20,000 years, and the earth has, uh, you know, experienced higher temperatures. So it has gone through these cycles every 100,000 years. And therefore, the mammalian herbivores, their diets, and all the other apparatus have also changed over time. So let us look more, again more closely at the Pleistocene period and look at the elephant diet. So if you ignore these two forms, about between two and three million years before present, most elephant forms were essentially grazers. And then you get this, the entry, uh, you get this trend towards a browsing diet or a mixed feeding diet, especially in the modern elephant, which is Elephas maximus. Okay. Now, if Asian elephants are adapted to a grazing diet, then the question is, why do they eat a lot of browse? The trend towards a browsing diet actually began with the ancestor of the modern elephant, that is Elephas physetricus. You see the fossils of this of this uh, ancestral form in the Shivali Hills, for instance, and sometimes in the Narmada Valley and so on during the middle Pleistocene. And during that time, we had the entry, a brief entry of a gigantic elephant form called Paleoloxodon, you know, whose, uh, um, you know, life, uh, existence in India, all that is actually, you know, emerging only very, very, very recently. We do not know much about Paleoloxodon nomadicus. But Paleoloxodon was a gigantic form, probably one of the largest elephants ever to have lived on this earth, largest mammal to ever, ever lived on this earth, and it was a grazer. So, the hypothesis is that this grazing form, you know, displaced Elephas hysoticus from the plains into the hills where the Elephas hysoticus had to do, had to feed on C3 plants in, uh, and not C4 plants. And at the same time, we had the spread of early humans, right? Early humans, I mean, our ancestors, Homo erectus, who have been around for about a million or two million years in the Indian subcontinent. You find remains of Homo erectus all over the South Asia. Therefore, there is a certain amount of competition from early humans. Elephas maximus evolved from Elephas hysoticus and continued the strategy of feeding on browse, even though it is adapted to a grazing diet. Now, the earth has gone through these uh, glacial interglacial cycles. About uh, last glacial maximum is about 20,000 years before present. The earth was much colder than it is today. India was essentially an arid, arid, an arid land with ostriches and and so on. We did not have much forest at that time. And then the earth started warming. And by about 10,000 years ago, the beginning of the Holocene, the tropical forest spread across India. India was very arid 20,000 years ago. There were modern humans there. Okay. It's a very cold place to live in, not very hospitable. By 10,000 years ago, the, the earth had become warmer, the forest had spread. And uh, therefore, you had more browse or C3 plants available for Elephas maximus. And therefore, they had to feed on that. Okay, so with the Holocene 10,000 years ago, the spread of Elephas maximus across the subcontinent means that with the spread of C3 plants, they were forced to start feeding on C3 plants. Then at the same time, if you recall our civilizational history, if you look at the spread of agriculture, the origins of agriculture go back about 10,000 years. And in India, in a significant way, about five or 6,000 years, starting from the Harappan, uh, period and going through the Mauryan period, you have had the Indo Gangetic basin completely deforested and uncultivated. Now, what would have happened is essentially, irrespective of climate, 
as humans started spreading across the Indian subcontinent, you have um, the Elephas Maximus being pushed into the hills. They are not allowed to occupy the plains anymore. The Indo-Gangetic Basin is off limits for them. They get into the foothills of the Himalayas. They go further south into the Vindhyas and the Satpuras. And similarly, as agriculture spreads into peninsular India, they are pushed into the hills of the Eastern Ghats and the Western Ghats with browse vegetation. The dental apparatus says that it is adapted to grazing, but now they occupy the hills which has more C3 plants. And therefore, here is a creature that is now pushed into the hills. On the other hand, humans have started cultivating its favored food plant, which is grass, in the form of cereals. It could have been barley in the past, and then you had rice and a variety of other cereals being cultivated. This would have been very tempting to a herbivore. And therefore, crop breeding is a natural consequence of the evolutionary legacy and historical legacy of Asian. Okay. So this is something that I have inferred in very, very recently, only in the last two or three years, the imprint of the evolutionary and the historical legacy. Okay. Now let's take the story forward to the Holocene, I mean to the Anthropocene rather, and see you know, how the elephants adapt, adapt, adapted to the Anthropocene when humans have made major changes to much more major changes to the environment. Okay, so they still continue to eat, eat a lot of browse because of the competition from humans and therefore they are forced to occupy the hills. But let's come back to the, uh, you know, I would say even going a little before the Anthropocene. Now, conflict between elephants and humans is not new, it is ancient. I've been searching the ancient literature, I've been looking at depictions of elephant in art, and this is the most ancient sculpture that I ever found. This is in Udayagiri Caves, very close to Bhubaneswar. And this shows a herd of elephants and people confronting these elephants. If you look at this scene, it's in Udayagiri cave number two. The next time you go to Bhuvaneshwar, please go to Udayagiri Kandagiri. It is right there at the, in the suburbs of Bhuvaneshwar. Udayagiri cave number two, you find the scene, uh, you know, uh, a bas relief, and you will find a confrontation between elephants and humans. Okay. The first visual depiction that I have ever found, this goes back to the first century, uh, almost 2000, 2000 years. Then you go to our ancient literature, you go to the Gajasasara, which is attributed to the sage Palkapya. Well, uh, sage Palkapya came from the northeast of the country, Rohit district in you know, Assam or Machal. And he talks about the king of Anga, which is of course Bihar. The king of Anga was seated on a throne and people reported to him that all the crops of grain were being destroyed by wild elephants. Okay, this seems very, very familiar to us because today you have Farmers making a representation to the government saying that all the wild elephants have, have come and destroyed the crops. If you open the newspapers, you know, almost, a, you know, in many parts of the country, almost every week you get a report of elephants coming and ravaging agricultural fields and damaging crops and sometimes killing people. Okay. It's not a new story. It, it is there ever since the dawn of agriculture. The Tamil Sangam poems, you know, also speak of male elephants raiding the millet fields and the farmers keeping guard at night. So nothing much has changed in the last 2000 years when it comes to elephant human interactions. And if you contemplate a little more closely about Lord Ganesha, it's a very different story. Think about Ganesha's pot belly and you think about the broken tusk of Ganesha. Ganesha is a deity born out of conflict. It has been in conflict with another male elephant. It has fed a lot, it has eaten a lot of food and therefore you have the pot belly. So somebody who invented Ganesha in, you know, about 1500 years ago, fifth century, uh, of the common era, obviously had elephant-human conflict in mind. Now, coming to the Anthropocene, elephant-human conflicts are escalating in recent times. 500 people are killed each year by wild elephants, tens of crores of rupees worth of damage each year. So this is not a joke, really, because this is a very, very serious problem, and the conflicts have been going up for a variety of different reasons. You have loss of property, loss of cultivated crops, and sadly, human lives, which is happening, you know, Practically, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, every week there is a human who is killed by a wild elephant. Now, apart from the evolutionary and the historical legacy, you have a whole complex suite of factors that drive elephant-human conflicts in the Anthropocene. I like to divide this between the, what I call uh, an evolutionary biologist would say approximate causation and ultimate causation. So you have a number of approximate causes like habitat loss and fragmentation, and degradation. At the same time, we have land use patterns that we have changed over time, you know, agriculture, 
you know, setting up industries, infrastructure, roads, railway lines, and so on and so forth. And then we have adverse climatic events that are taken over today, you know, especially now in the Anthropocene. And then you have an increase in the elephant population as well as the human population. But then in ultimate terms, in, it's, a, it's a search by elephants for trying to optimize its foraging by searching for the most op, uh, nutritious crops, uh, plants available for it. And I'll come to that. And we need to go into the behavioral ecology of elephants, and there is a whole role for learning and culture. Let me briefly illustrate these uh, points. Habitat loss, you know, very, very rapid in countries like Malaysia and Indonesia, where oil palm has replaced tropical rainforest through clear filling of huge swaths of land, which were Rainforest, like you can see the inset in the, on the top, have been replaced with oil palm. Now, this has a lesson for us because India is also planning to, you know, increase uh, for area under oil palm plantation. But oil palm is also attractive food for elephants. So not only will it cause loss of biodiversity if you, if you clear forest, but also elephants will come and feed on the oil palm because the palm family, the palme, is food for elephants also. Then you have habitat loss and attendant fragmentation. You see, I am mining iron ore in central India. There's nothing that grows here. It's a complete loss of habitat for elephants. And if you look at this picture from taken from Kionja district in Odisha, you see the, you know, you see the brown and the green, and the brown is the ravages caused by mining. So this fragments the habitat, you know, to such a great extent that elephants find it difficult to move in this landscape. So they have to find the green patches and they have to move. And then they encounter cultivation much more frequently, and then there is conflict. So all these are what I call proximate causes. Over the past 15 years, you know, Lantana, Kamara, many of you all are familiar with this. It has been around for 200 years in the country. But the last 15 or 20 years, there's been an explosion in Lantana, Kamara, across deciduous forests of southern India. And Lantana, Kamara is, is not fodder for the herbivores. Yeah, it has replaced grasses and it has taken over the understory of huge areas of forest in southern India. And uh, therefore, this has caused habitat degradation. And perhaps the elephants are forced out of the forest because of this. But if you look at it in ultimate terms, cultivated crops provide concentrated sources of food. If you go to a ragi field or if you go to a paddy field, an elephant can feed, you know, it can take 12 kg per hour of ragi or paddy. You know, per hour of feeding. On the other hand, if it feeds on wild grasses, it can only take about six kilos per hour. Therefore, what the elephant needs to spend only half the amount of time it would normally spend in feeding. It normally spends 12 to 18 hours of feeding in the forest to meet its forage requirements. In half the time, it can meet its requirements by feeding on cultivated crops. And the cultivated crops are more palatable, lower levels of plant secondary compounds, and so on and so forth. And most important, higher levels of nutrition, especially protein and sodium and calcium, compared to the uh, wild grasses that it's able to get. And therefore, it is not surprising that elephants try to optimize their diets by trying to seek cultivated crops, you know, especially since you have a very close interface between agriculture and, uh, and forest in countries like India, which have a very long history of colonization by people and the spread of agriculture. The, there's also a behavioral angle to this. And many years ago, uh, I found that male elephants are much more prone to raiding crops compared to female elephants. Because these male elephants are seeking these crops because they can then grow much larger in body size by feeding on nutritious food. They can come into must. Must is a, a physiological and a behavioral phenomenon. When they, when they come into must, they can successfully challenge other males in must, uh, which are not in must. And, uh, the females also have a choice for the male elephant in mass in terms of mating. Therefore, the male elephant is willing to take more risks in going and raiding crops because potentially it can gain much more in terms of reproductive success. You know, to quote uh, or to uh, you know echo the language of an evolutionary biologist. Therefore, male elephants are much more prone to raid crops. And something very interesting is happening in recent times in terms of adaptation of these male elephants which I will tell you. You know, in my early study, I found that when you, when, you look, when you watch an elephant inside the forest, you typically get a single elephant, you know, solitary male elephant, or you get 
um, you know, an association of two males. You know, you don't get larger associations. But in the night when I used to go into the villages and look for crop raiding elephants, I found that they were up to four elephants joining together and raiding crops because they are now cooperating in facing hostile farmers and going and raiding crops. And crops are available in plenty, so there's no need for competition. But there was a, a benefit to be obtained from cooperation among these males. But see what has happened in the Anthropocene. Okay, now what is happening is this is like a, you know, a classroom. You have the professor, you have the postdoc, and you have the students. And uh, there is cultural transmission, horizontal transmission in this case, of learning. The young males are associating with the older males because then they can learn the tricks of raiding, how to venture into a potentially risky situation, and so on and so forth. So these males, there's a lot of kind of uh, exchange of information. There's a whole process of cultural transmission of behavior and a whole process of learning among, among them. So that is this evolution of a very complex kind of a male elephant society that is happening. And these all male groups are now getting larger and larger in size. And this is what we think is a novel adaptive social strategy in an increasingly anthropogenic landscape, especially where we have studied in southern India. But the same is true also of other parts of the country. Look at this bull group. You know, it's about 12 to 15 elephants or so. All of them are males. You know, these kind of novel all male groups of such large sizes have never, never been seen before, at least in the last 40 or 50 years uh, in India. And the group size of these male elephants also increased with the availability of crops. So that's very, very interesting. More crops, the larger the male groups adaptation. So you get these kind of big, big male groups forming. They're all males. There are no females in this. Sometimes people think these are female groups or families. These are not families. These are uh, all male associations. And the body condition of the male in, improves when they are in high crop areas. So they form larger groups. They're able to tackle the hostile farmers. They're able to successfully raid and they have become large in body size. So that is the kind of trend that you find in elephants. And this is an adaptive strategy in order to re enhance their reproductive success. Because when the male grows larger, it becomes, comes into must. It goes back to the forest to mate with females uh, for six months, comes back for the crop raiding during the cropping season. So there is this very novel type of movement behavior that is happening. And lo and behold, this is a very large village tank in the city, very close to the town of Tumkur, very close to Bangalore, an hour drive from Bangalore. What the males do? is that these males go and uh, park themselves you know, in the lake during the daytime, six o'clock in the morning till six in the evening. And in the nighttime, they go and raid crops. So the whole behavioral pattern of the elephants in the Anthropocene has changed. Now we come to the family groups or the female groups. This is a female elephant that we put a GPS collar in the state of West Bengal almost 15 years ago. This also shows food seeking behavior. And if you look at this, uh, this map, uh, you have Nepal on the west, uh, Bhutan is somewhere towards the north, and Bangladesh is to the south. This elephant spends a lot of its time only in the forest, but during the cropping season, it goes to the Nepal border and raids crops, you know, which are very attractive towards it. And it describes a home range of about 1,000 square kilometers. So elephants go to great lengths to raid crops. And what is the consequences of this? when they are raiding crops. When I show this picture to a general audience, I show the top elephant, which is somewhat bony, and uh, the bottom elephant, which is much more robustly built. I ask them, you know, which elephant is found inside a protected forest area, like a national park? People would usually say the elephant at the bottom is the elephant in a national park. The elephant on the top is a, a starving elephant, you know, which is outside a forest area. It's completely wrong, completely wrong, because Actually, the elephant below is found in an agricultural area, and the elephant above is found in a national park. So what more recently my research team, team did, we looked at levels of stress in elephants. Farmers chase elephants. When elephants go into agricultural areas, they face a lot of stress because they are chased, they are shot at, they are injured, and so on and so forth. We looked at glucocorticoid metabolite by non-invasive sampling in fecal samples, and we correlated this with body condition both of elephants inside and outside the park. And you see this in coffee plantation. Look how robustly this female elephant is in a coffee plantation in Karnataka. And this is an, a female elephant in a Bandipur National Park. Very, very typical actually. And what we found 
was that the fecal glucocorticoid metabolite levels of elephants living outside national park was lower, meaning they were at less lower levels of physiological stress compared to those living inside the national park. So they were gaining something by going out, taking the risks and raiding the calves. And what was that? That is superior nutrition. The habitat outside has higher NDVI values, which was an indication of the amount of green matter that is there. And when you look at the fecal nitrogen content, an indicator of uh, the uh, uh, protein levels, you will find that uh, the protein level in the elephants that are going out and raiding crops is higher. So they were getting a superior diet, and this was making up, more than making up for the stress that they had to undergo by going and facing hostile farmers and so on and so forth. So this is how elephants are adapt adapting in the Anthropocene. I'll just take two, a couple of minutes more, and uh, I will, uh, Five more minutes, yes, thank you. And uh, today we, you know, in the Anthropocene, climate climate change is, you know, central concern is, you know, I would say the most uh, serious uh, existential problem that humankind is facing today. You know, I also work in the field of climate change. I'm very closely associated with IPCC and a number of other initiatives on climate change. Now, in 1982-83, we had a major dispersal of an elephant clan that left Osur division in Tamil Nadu and marched off northward into Andhra because of a very serious drought. 86, 87 elephants from Central India, from Bihar, they went to Bengal. And similar kind of dispersals have been happening more recently. Okay, this is the early 1980 dispersal from the uh, area close south of Bangalore to the area east of Bangalore. Now, we all know, and this is a very familiar graph to all of you, the IPCC, the projections of future increase in temperature, changes in rainfall, papers coming out that El Nino, which uh, frequencies might increase, which El Nino, you know, once you have a very strong El Nino, you have a drought-like situation in the Southern Hemisphere and India too. And this is, could increase with global warming. This year we had a La Nina, and therefore we had excess rainfall. But in a few years time, we could have an El Nino. So this could, in increase elephant human conflicts because these elephants don't go out they go into areas where elephants have never been found in the last few hundred years i recently came back from madhya pradesh where our last elephants were seen during the mughal period and elephants have come back now to bandhavgarh national park and you know they are trying to see how what how they want to do with it so climate change could exacerbate you know problems of elephant human conflicts now, management and mitigation of conflict is a topic by itself, a whole suite of different things people have tried, but the most of this has have failed so far because of the intelligence of the elephant. Till I saw this picture, I did not believe that an elephant could do a circus feat. You know, people dig trenches like this along the boundary of a forest to prevent them from getting over and going into an agricultural area. But you look at the circus feat that the elephant is performing. You know, it would put to shame, uh, you know, um, or circus artists. I did, you could never think with all that bulk that the elephant could do this. It is desperate to go and seek those nutritious crops. We put up electric fences. Elephants learn that the soles of their feet are poor conductors, you know. So they have learned uh, physics, uh, you know, I don't know where they learned their physics from, uh, but they are certainly better in uh, their knowledge of electricity than, <laughs> than I am. And uh, they get across an electric fence out of the forest. So, Elephants have proved to be a real challenge to, to human uh, technological innovation. We have to be, you know, it's an evolution, like an evolutionary arms race. We have to be one up against them. And of course, you know, this is an elephant in Bengal, and these Bengal elephants do things that elephants in other parts of the country can never do. <laughs> this is in the town of Siliburi. This elephant has come to a mall, you know, during a Hindu festival, and I'm sure that it will do that for festivals of other religions too. Mercifully, nobody was killed in this episode. But uh, this is increasingly the Anthropocene age, and this is what is elephant. elephants are doing. They're feeding on garbage, and uh, they're crossing major expressways and highways. This is the Bangalore Chenna Highway. They're getting hit by trains. Uh, a lot of elephants get hit by trains. You must be reading in the newspapers. The hit by trains coincides with the two cropping seasons in West Bengal when they come out from the crop. When you have a lot of crop, they come out of the forest, they get hit by trains. So this is, seems to be the new norm. This is my last slide, really. And uh, the solution to managing elephants, to conserving elephants in the long term 
is to plan at the scale of landscapes and uh, project elephant reserves and keep them here, not allow them to wander all over the place. And that's how we need to plan for the future of elephant conservation and to provide relief to the farmers and people who share the elephant's habitat and who are suffering by the impact of elephants in the Anthropocene. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sukumar. <clears throat> that was a fascinating uh, treat on the elephants. Uh, uh, we will have a couple of questions before we uh, go to the next speaker, but uh, uh, my, just some observations. Uh, this, uh, you know, gels so beautifully with the with this Miocene, uh, this major uh, plant physiological situer from C3 to C4, uh, which has a, a great link with, uh, you know, intensification of uh, monsoon in the Indian subcontinent. And uh, also that uh, almost 90% of Poesi, which is the C4 uh, plants, they diversified in the subcontinent roughly between 11, 11 to 12 million years. So this, uh, this uh, entire story gels so beautifully uh, that, you know, uh, so everything seems to be, seems to be linked and that's, that's the way it should be. And I think it is high time that we start thinking in terms of general rules for biology where there are none though. Uh, you know, they, they see. The second thing, of course, which you suggested was Lantana Kamara, which is invading many of the South Indian forests, but that's happening all over subtropical, you know, from east to west sub Himalayan tracks, that many of these forests are now, you know, sort of dominated. The, the, the ground cover is dominated by Lantana Kamara, which is pushing uh, more, uh, you know, human wildlife conflict. Now, so may I invite, if you have a couple of questions for Professor Sukumar, then we'll go to the next speaker, please. Can I, uh, I, I, you can't see me because my camera is not working. This is Chandrima Shaha. Yeah, I, yes, Chandrima, please. Uh, I was wondering that uh, when you showed that these animals which are inside the national parks are so thin and, you know, rickety kind, uh, whereas the others are more healthier, is there a record of kind of diseases they have, uh, you know, uh, due to malnutrition or due to lesser nutrition? Or are they by stress developing uh, diseases like diabetes? Or uh... um, no, actually, I'll put it the other way around. In fact, you know, the natural condition of uh, elephants in high density populations inside forest areas. See, it's hard work for the elephant to go and seek the right kind of a food and so on and so forth. But um, the elephants inside national parks they are reproducing reasonably well. You know, it's, there's nothing wrong with them. They do suffer from diseases. I would not even call them malnutrition. You know, it's a bit of a subjective uh, impression from our side. In fact, I would say that elephants that are outside the national parks actually are obese. And in fact, one line of research that we are really trying to start is looking at the health consequences of obesity in elephants, whereby they go and they really engorge themselves. You know, of course, the males do it, they come into must and all of that. But if the females do it, what actually what happens and so on. You know? So this is a kind of a line of uh, investigation that I'm trying to begin now. Uh, but uh, but inside the national park, that's how elephants are, and they've been like that for the last 30, 40 years that I've been observing elephants. They seem to be doing reasonably well. They are fairly resilient when it comes to drought. There's no big die-off of elephants mortality. So they do have you know slightly enhanced mortality, but they get along reasonably well actually. But it's really the attraction of the crops outside that's driving them out. They are being more robust and a lot, whole lot of other consequences. Thank you. So we have a. We have an increased population of elephants, right? In India. Absolutely. Absolutely. At least in the last 40 years, we have an increased population of elephants. Yes, Meva, please go ahead. Uh, Sukumar, so, what is the oldest uh, elephant, earliest in the history of the earth? 60 million years? No, 60 million is about the start of uh, the the, uh, the order called the uh, mammalian order called Proboscidea. Okay. Proboscideans. So proboscidean is not an elephant. Uh, it is, um, you know, the ancestor. I mean, the, the order proboscidea, the elephant is actually family elephantidae. And uh, that family elephantidae evolved about uh, six or seven million years ago in Africa. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sukumar. Meva. Yeah. Sukumar, huh? this increase in the crop foraging over the last 30, 40 years, 
it is also has been because of the changing of crop patterns. You see, many of these crops were earlier rain fed. And uh, during the rainy season, there was a lot of forage available for elephants in deciduous forests. So they were there. Now, because of the you know more canals coming up and more uh, bore wells, yeah. there has been there has been yeah. year-round cropping. Yeah, so that, that, yeah, that, that also is the reason that there is a crop foraging. Yeah, Meva, actually I removed all those slides in the interest of time, you know. I had a, a set of slides where uh, I want to show that India is actually greening more outside the forest yes. than in the forest. A lot of that's so. doing that, including our own studies. Uh, because of the irrigation canals, now water is available around the year. And earlier the cropping uh, used to be, agriculture used to be a single crop, rain fed. And now the crops are available almost around the year. Farmers are able yes. to get two or three crops, you know, which is good for it in terms of economics. They are more prosperous. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely. I removed those slides from my presentation for the sake of time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, thank you. I would have to uh, stop here. Uh, let's go to the next speaker uh, for the afternoon today, uh, Professor K. Ganeshia. Uh, uh, thank, thank, thank you again uh, for in, uh, accepting our invitation at a rather short notice. I, so, so, so nice of you. So, Professor Ganeshia is going to speak to us about uh, conflict communication and uh, there is another C, which I'm just forgetting, but yeah, uh, but, and I think he's uh, sort of uh, done it so beautifully. He says that there is, they don't understand, you know, evolution does not understand botany and zoology. So I think this is the, this is high time that we broke these disciplinary silos. Uh, welcome, uh, Professor Ganeshia, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I also like to thank uh, INSA for inviting me to uh, deliver this uh, talk in the evening. So I have titled it Conflicts, Cooperation and Communication in Plants. Evolution does not know botany and zoology. I hope the slides start moving. It's not moving. Why is that? Mm. You unshare and share it again. I share it again. Yeah, I think it may not... share and share it again, then yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's frozen. Yeah. Uh, and share and share it again. Yes. Just a minute. I have not been able to go to the share uh, screen at all. <laughs> Just move the cursor above the... You will find that button in the uh, top of top. the window. Yeah, I click that. I click that and I get in here. You b go below, go a little below. We can see the. A little below. So, first keep your slide open and then there is a share button with an up arrow at the bottom of the WebEx screen. It's open. Then uh, I am not been able to expand the uh, Zoom screen to share. That is my problem. Uh, show active speaker thumbnail, show active speaker video view. Council Linsa speaking one minute. Sir, press F5. F5. That is simpler, but nothing is happening. Through the bottom uh, of this uh, PowerPoint screen, there is a. You will find an image like an umbrella. Yes, yeah, yes, this, yes, one. Sir, this the, one. It looks like an umbrella. Just click on click it on it. I am umbrella. No, I'm yeah. not finding. Uh, right of the comments. Right of the comments. Go. Now again. It's right at the bottom only. Ganesh. No, but that screen itself is not uh, there for me except my image and the council in some. Okay, I'll do one thing. I'll close my presentation first. Maybe. Uh, stop application sharing. Yeah. Now, I have come to the scene. I will open my presentation now. Go to share screen. Just a minute. Just a minute.
Yeah, I'm sharing now. Aditi, can you help? There's yes, a bit of delay. There's a bit no. of delay. No, don't worry. Yeah. Can you see my yes, sir. We are able to see now. Yeah. Yeah, I expand. Screen. Just click on it. Yeah, I'll it, go to the full screen. Really. Just leave it for a for a while. There is a delay. Okay, yes, okay, we are getting sir. Okay. Now, now can you see me? Yes, yes. Sir. Can see yeah. everything now. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So I have titled my talk Conflicts, Cooperation and Communication in Plants. And I like to start with Charles Darwin because perhaps any talk in biology cannot start without quoting Darwin. So here is a statement that Darwin once made. That is, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is one that is most adaptable to change. What I like to draw your attention is to this uh, point here that Darwin told that it is not the most strong organism that survives, not the most intelligent. Now, the reason I want to draw this uh, point to your attention is that we know that plants are supposed to be not intelligent. When it comes to intelligence, animals, of course, have the neural system. Plants do not have. Animals can, animals can think, memorize, and behave, but plants cannot. And so we have a field of uh, study called ethology, which is the behavior of animals, a subject that is exclusively restricted to zoology and not of botany. And the general feeling is that Animals behave and plants cannot. Animals think and plants cannot. Animals speak and plants cannot. And that's a kind of image that the entire biology, biologists had almost for two to three centuries. But what is surprising is that we never realized that evolution does not discriminate between plants and animals. Evolution does not know that there is something called botany and zoology. It's only our creation, the human creation. In fact, evolution shapes all organisms the same way and if Darwin is right in telling that it is the adaptive behavior of the organism that makes it survive, then all organisms are expected to develop the adaptive behaviors that help them survive. And my talk is exclusively now trying to make this point that plants also have uh, a behavioral adaptations and what I can call it as plant ethology. What I will do is to start with to demonstrate that in fact, Plants do all that we describe what a behavior is. In fact, they can sense, they can feel, they can integrate information, and they also can respond to the situation based on the information that they gather and by processing that information. I would like to take this argument through an example from a plant called Hemilia patterns. The question I would like to ask here is, do plants really now show all these elements of behavior? That is sensing, integrating information, and responding in accordance to the information that they've obtained. Hemilia patens is a bird dispersed species. As you can see, the fruits here are plucked by the birds and they are dispersed. Incidentally, Hemilia patens bears fruits almost throughout the year and these fruits are dispersed by the migratory birds. Sadly, migratory birds are very unpredictable in their arrival and so plant does not know when to actually ripen its fruits. Though it produces the fruits throughout the year, it has to keep its fruits in the ripened situation only when the birds come and not otherwise. But the arrival of the birds is unpredictable. Now, how do they do this? They need to ripen only when the dispersal are in abundance and not just, you know, when a couple of birds come there. So they have to integrate this information. In other words, it appears there is a challenge for the plant here. What is the challenge? First of all, they have to sense the arrival of the birds, though they don't have the ears and eyes to now sense the birds. Then they also have to now keep a count of the density of the birds that are arriving because more the birds, it has to now mature or ripen the fruits accordingly. So it has to integrate the density of the birds that is as it has sensed and accordingly assess what is the level of dispersal that it can achieve and thus respond by ripening the fruits to the extent that there are birds. So in other words, there is a challenge here for the plant to sense, to integrate information and accordingly to respond. And if you see that the plant can actually do all this, we can perhaps conclude that yes, this plant also is behaving just like animals do. Do they do? Yes, in fact, they do. The way they do is that, in fact, very clearly it has been established that more the birds, more ripening of the fruits, 
lesser the birds, less ripening of the fruits. How do they do this? Now, this uh, Levy in 1987 has published a paper, a very interesting paper on the similia patterns. And what he did was the following. He simulated the removal of the fruits by birds artificially by plucking the fruits from the plant uh, directly by, by himself. What happened was that as he removed the fruits from the tree that caused injury to the uh, plant and that injury induces ethanol and this ethanol in turn actually enhances the fruit ripening. In other words, when birds come there, they now pluck the fruit and when the fruits are plucked, there is ethanol produced, which in turn feeds back to the plant, suggesting that there are more, more birds plucking the fruits, in turn maturing more fruits, thus higher the rate of uh, removal, higher the rate of ripening through the production of ethanol, thus in other words, Hemilia also seem to sense, integrate and respond adaptively just as animals do. Thus, one can say, in fact, plants exhibit all strategies in the similar way as animals do, though they do not have eyes, they do not have ears to now look at the birds. In other words, it's very clear that plants behave just as animals do. It is perhaps our arrogance to now think that plants cannot behave. I would rather go one step ahead. In fact, for plants to behave, there is no need of neural system as animals do. And in that sense, plants seem to be now more efficient in behaving to the occasions than animals do because they do it without even neural system at the brains. Having shown that plants do behave, let me now go to the three components I have outlined in the talk. That is, plants do exhibit conflicts, plants do exhibit cooperation, and they also communicate. Now, when it comes to conflict, there are several kinds of conflicts. The two conflicts I would like to take today for demonstrating is sibling rivalry and parent offspring conflict. Robert Rivers, sometime during 1972, proposed this concept called parent offspring conflict, and he interpreted it as an outcome of the natural selection operating on the opposite directions on the mother and the uh, offspring. Now, without going into the details of what Trevor told, I would like to demonstrate this conflict between parents and offspring through a drama that goes on in the nest of a bird. Let us say any bird for that matter has laid about three eggs or four eggs. Now, a mother bird would lay as many eggs as it can because it wishes to enhance its own fitness by making sure that all these four eggs mature and they develop into reproductive stage and they reproduce. Thus, there will be fitness increasing to the Darwinian mother. So it lays as many eggs as she can and it feeds them all equally in the sense it would like to now make sure that all eggs are equally taken care of. They grow to reproduction and they reproduce and thus mother's fitness would increase. Well, this is the interest of the Darwinian mother. But let's, let us look at what would be the interest of a Darwinian offspring. Every egg when it hatches, it becomes a Darwinian offspring. What would be the interest of a Darwinian offspring? Now, each of these Darwinian offspring is only interested in its own self because it is trying to increase its own fitness just as the mother is trying to increase its own fitness. As a result, each of these offspring demands more resources from the mother. When the mother gets the food to the nest, each of the offspring demands cries and produces the chirping noises so that it demands more food from the mother. And in the process, it tries to get more than others, grow better than others, reproduce more than others, thus increase its own fitness. In other words, when the mother is trying to now give equal amount of food to all the individual offsprings, individual offspring is greedy. It is trying to demand more resources to itself. Thus, there seems to be a conflict between the parent and the offspring. This is what is called as the parent offspring conflict. And there is a problem here for the mother. What is the problem? Whether to yield to this crying baby or not. Now, if at all she yields to the greedy offspring, there will be unequal growth among the offspring. The one that demands more only grows, and other would be now suffering, and so there would be reduced fitness. So it would not like to yield to the crying offspring. But there is a problem if the mother does not yield to the crying fledgling. What happens when the mother does not yield to the crying baby, the crying baby's sounds or vocal levels increase as a result, result of which the predators may be attracted there. And though, so the entire colony might be in danger. So 
mother loses the entire colony. Thus, there is a dilemma that the mother faces to listen to the crying offspring and feed it or not to feed it. It turns out that in the process, actually, mother loses. Now, having said that, let us now look at whether this can really happen in plants. Now, look at on the left hand side the nest of a bird, and on the right hand side the pod of a plant. As you can see, there, are, there is a nest, and here there is a pod coat. There are eggs developing there, there are seeds developing there. Here, the mother feeds all those four eggs, and in the case of pod, the mother actually feeds all the offspring through the peduncle. So, there is a lot of similarity between the fruit and a nest. All seeds in a fruit develop together just as the eggs develop in a nest. Mother feeds through the peduncle just as the mother bird gets the food and feeds the offspring. And just as the offspring in a nest can compete for the maternal resources, seeds in a pod also could compete for the maternal resources. That there is a potential for the parents and offspring to conflict in plants also. But does it occur? Well, to answer this question of whether it does it occur or not, let us go and see what actually happens in some extreme situations in birds. In birds, especially boobies and raptors, what happens is the young ones that develop actually peck the, sorry, the elder ones actually peck the young ones and they sometimes also elbow the younger ones out of the nest so that they are killed and it becomes the lone survivor in the nest so that it can get all the food that the mother would get. In other words, there is what is called as the fratricide, brother-brother killing or sister-sister killing or sibling rivalry exists in the plants, sorry, in the boobies and the raptors. Now, we found a similar system in a plant called Dalbergia sisu. Now, this is a, these are the parts of Dalbergia sisu. What you see on the left-hand side is the flowers and the uh, leaves. Now, Dalbergia sisu produces parts that actually are dispersed through wind. The parts are very wing-like very thin and when they are dried, they can be blown off the wind and so they are dispersed by the wind. If you collect about 100 parts of Dalbergia and count the number of seeds in each part, it turns out that more than 80 to 90 percent of the parts will be having always a single seed, whereas about 15 to 20 percent will be having two to three seeds. What I am giving here, the data of 80 percent is actually on the lower extreme. 90% of the plants will be having more than 90% of the parts having only one seed. In other words, almost always in Dalbergia, a part will be having only a single seed. But where is the sibling rivalry coming here? If you go to the flower of Dalbergia sisu and examine carefully, it turns out that it has got about four to five ovules. In other words, there is a potential for the plant to produce four seeds in each part but as I told, in most of the situations, about 85 to 97 percent of the situations, it is only one seed that is developing. On the right hand side, I have shown you a part of Dalbergia held against the sun. What you can see, it is a developing seed at the top of the part and the aborted ovules at the base of the part. Just as in raptors, there is a surviving individual that has killed the other uh, younger fledglings. Here again, it appears that the dominant seeds seem to have killed the other ovules, which we call as aborted ovules. But is it really a killing? Now, we examine whether in fact in Dalbergia sisu, the death of those uh, ovules or the abortion of ovules is because of reasons that we can attribute to that that we generally know of. We found that there is no problem with the pollen grains. There is no problem of lack of pollination or lack of fertilization. There are enough pollen grains on the stigma and all ovules, in fact, are fertilized. We could establish it through UV photography that pollen grains do grow into the ovules and they are all fertilized. And in fact, abortion occurs after fertilization. So fertilization is not a problem. And is it that they don't have resources? No. The invariance of or the, the repeated abortion that happens of, uh, in the parts of Dalbergia seem to suggest that it is not a resource constraint because even if you now remove all the inflorescences in the tree and leave only two or three inflorescences, even there you always find 90 percent of the parts having only a single seed. So the abortion is not because of lack of resources. It is also not because of the pest or pathogen. Very clearly there are no pests and pathogens. Thus, it turns out that the abortion seems to be not due to the known reasons that we can attribute to it seems to be a consistent invariant future in Dalbergia. 
Why is it invariant feature? There seem to be some advantage of always producing a single seed. As I told, these parts are dispersed through wind and uh, lighter the part, farther the distance they go. Obviously, the single seeded parts in relation to the surface area they have will be able to disperse farther. And in fact, we have now done the study and it shows that the dispersal advantage measured in terms of the distance to which the parts are thrown away when the wind is blown onto them shows that the single seeded parts are always dispersed to farther distances compared to two or three seeded parts. Thus, there is an advantage to be a single seeded part or for an offspring, it is good to be in a single seeded than in the two or three seeded parts because in two or three seeded parts, individual seeds suffer from dispersal and they do not gain. Thus, single seeded parts disperse to farther distances and so the seeds in those single seeded parts gain much more dispersal advantage and fitness than that are uh, there in the two or three seeded parts. So in other words, it is advantageous to be the lone survivor and hence it is in fact good to be the lone survivor and so perhaps they are trying to now kill the other offsprings. So in fact, in Dalbergia you will see that there is a clear conflict. Mother produces five, five ovules whereas the interest of the offspring is not in line with the interest of the mother. The mother's interest is to bear more offspring but offspring interest is to be the lone survivor and for that it appears that they are killing the other brothers and they are involving in sibling rivalry resulting in conflict between parent and offspring. Now is it really true that it is happening as we thought as if the, the dominant ovule or dominant seed is killing the other offspring? Actually, when we tracked the whole of this uh, development of the part, it turns out that there is a dominance hierarchy that is established among these seeds from top to the bottom in general. That the ovule that is first fertilized becomes the most dominant towards the distal end of the part, as shown here, and that becomes the most dominant embryo, and that causes abortion of the subordinates towards the proximal end of the part. And in fact, we have found that at a very, very young age, if we remove the dominant ovule, the ones at the base are capable of developing and one next to it actually dominates. But if we remove that also, the one next to it dominates. Thus, all of them are capable of developing. The presence of the most dominant at the, at the distal end is actually causing the death of the ones at the base. Now, we actually wanted to test whether it is the dominant seed that is causing the death of the rest of the ovules. So what we did was, we collected some developing ovules into small petri dishes and we applied onto them tissues from different parts of the Dalbergia part. We collected the tissue from the mother uh, component of the part, that is a mother's tissue. We collected the tissue from the developing dominant embryo and we also collected the embryos, aborting embryos and we now poured the extract of them onto them and within about five days you can see that when the mother's tissue is poured onto the, the developing ovules, nothing happens. They continue to now grow, whereas the extract from the dominant embryo is poured onto it, most of them abort within five days, and nothing happens when the aborted ovules and tissue is uh, put onto them, demonstrating that the dominant embryos actually are causing abortion, and the death is not, or the killing is not by the mother or by any other mechanism, but by the dominant ovule actually starving the developing embryos to death. When I say it is starving, we wanted to see, in fact, in, if there is any difference in the uptake of the carbon. So we implanted the parts in C14 shiprows, and we found that the dominant embryo draws about 860 counts per minute of the C14 shiprows for every 100 embryos, whereas the subordinate aborting embryos could draw only about 100 counts per minute of the shiprows. Now, one might say that this may be because the dominant embryo anyway is dominant and so it's drawing more. What is interesting is when we remove the dominant embryos, the subordinates could now immediately pick up and they could draw 937 counts per minute of C14 sucrose uh, compared to 112 CPM when they were actually being suppressed by the dominant embryo. Thus, it appears that the dominant embryo is doing something. It is inhibiting the resource uptake by the subordinate embryos. How does it inhibit? I will not go into the details. We have found that there is a chemical that is produced by the most dominant embryo whose gradient as it goes down the part actually kills the subordinate embryos 
and this chemical also we have established it to be an iia derivative which was known as the killing hormone as early as 1940s but the purpose of the killing hormone was not known it does appear that plants also have the killing agents that they employ to kill the siblings when they have to gain the dominance over others i will stop that story of dalbergia there but only extend uh, to tell that whenever thus there is an advantage of dispersal by being a lone survivor in the fruit or the pod the plant siblings also turn to now kill their uh, relatives or their siblings and this can be expected in the wind dispersal species and animal dispersal species why in animal dispersal species because in animal dispersal species lesser the number of seeds more palatable the fruit is more pulpy the fruit is animals prefer them and swallow them whereas if the seeds are more they regurgitate and thus the dispersal is affected and we have found that in the animal and wind dispersal species in fact the seed to ovule ratio that is the extent of seed development goes on reducing with the ovule number a suggesting that whenever there is a high seed number there is high abortion whenever there is less seed number there is less abortion in almost you know any wind and animal dispersal sorry wind and water dispersal species that we have tested now this brings us to another question so far what we have seen is that the dominant ovule or dominant seed kills the younger ones but does the mother keep quiet if at all there is a conflict a conflict should now continue evolutionarily and evolution would always now favor counter strategies in each of the participants involved can mother reduce the sibling size it turns out that many of the botanical details that we observe for which we did not know the reason seems to be possible to be explained by this parent offspring conflict and sibling rivalry for instance evolution of septa evolution of triploid endosperm evolution of polyembryony all of them seem to be maternal counter strategies to now reduce the offspring driven seed abortion or sibling rivalry for example if you now take the septa what does septa do it compartmentalizes the developing ovaries or ovules into small you know uh, cells so that if at all there is competition happening that competition is compartmentalized just as the criminals are kept from Uh, each other by putting them into small cells so that they don't kill each other or they don't uh, hurt each other plants also seem to now develop these septa or separating walls to ensure that the level of competition is reduced and mother could harvest at least as many seeds as there are septa this of course all of you would have experienced when you now eat the orange or citrus fruits in each of those locule you see that there will be one or two seeds but imagine if all of them were grouped together perhaps the entire fruit would have got only one or two seeds in addition to that the triploid endosperm that we see in plants which has got two elements of maternal genome and one element of paternal genome also seems to be a maternal strategy of regulating the flow of resources into the embryo due to lack of uh, time i will not go into the details of that but it's been proven uh, that the endosperm which is a very unique tissue to, to the plants is perhaps a maternal counter strategy to now uh, control the offspring that indulge in the sibling rivalry now polyembryony we know that some species produce more than one embryo in every seed it turns out that this seems to be more often found in situations where there is more abortion in many situations whenever polyembryony is found we know go back and look at the situation generally turns out that there is high abortion there that is only when there is more abortion the polyembryony comes about suggesting that it is a kind of compensatory mechanism but who is compensating it whether it is the mother tissue or any other tissue now if you look at the genetic system of the polyembryos uh, in the species that exhibit polyembryonic condition about 80% of the situation is actually by the maternal tissue the nucellar tissue nucellar tissue pumps in its own embryos whenever there is high abortion so that the mother gains what she has lost this is true in citrus genotypes true in uh, you know several other species where abortion is seen and in citrus we also have found that there is a strong correlation between the level of polyembryony and the level of seed abortion higher the seed abortion in a variety higher the polyembryony so in other words it seems that polyembryony is a maternal strategy to compensate the loss due to sibling rivalry 
Well, we have covered this in a review that came about in 1988 on parent offspring conflict, sibling rivalry, and brood size patterns. However, after this, we faced a severe problem. What is the problem? Look at these parts. What I told so far is an explanation for why there are single seeded parts. But you also see some 5 to 10 percent of the parts having 2 and 3 seeds. Now, how are they formed? Now, when we examined the genetic relatedness among these two uh, seeds that are developing within the two seeded part, or genetic relatedness among the three seeds developing within the three seeded parts, it turns out that on an average, they have more genetic relatedness compared to single seeded parts. You know, people uh, generally say that these are extreme situations or some errors or 5% chance that they are farming. No, there is no 5% chance. In fact, the reason why we went about studying this is that we were inspired by the statement by Stephen Jay Gold. Stephen Jay Gold says that whenever you find an oddity in nature, pursue it it perhaps becomes your bread and butter. So we pursued these 5 to 10% of the rare parts that are formed in Dalbergia. And we found that if you now look at the genetic similarity among the two and three seeded parts, the genetic similarity as shown here in the black bars is generally high compared to randomly chosen single seeded parts, suggesting that Genetically related seeds seem to favor each other. That is, when the two seeds are genetically related, they don't compete with each other. They favor, they, they tolerate, and uh, parts are formed with two or three seeds. Well, what happens to dispersal? Now, there is a compensation here. To the dispersal that I am losing, I am getting my own brother who is completely related to me. In other words, my fitness, my inclusive fitness is increasing. Whereas, if the two developing seeds are genetically unrelated, they compete with each other. This incidentally is also what we term as the inclusive fitness uh, theory or altruism. That is, whenever an individual favors another individual at the cost of itself, it, we call it as altruism. And altruism was in fact a challenge for Darwin to explain as to how it uh, can be explained through evolution because it is costing to the fitness of the individual. But today we know that compared to the Darwinian competitive uh, gain of the fitness, the kin cooperation or the kin selection is in fact also a Darwinian evolution where individual fitness is enhanced through the relatives that it is actually cooperating with. And this is called as kin cooperation or kin selection, where related individuals come together and they cooperate and they exhibit altruistic behavior with each other, whereas unrelated individuals compete with each other. And this is explained in a more formal way by WDT Hamilton as theory of inclusive fitness. And I will not perhaps go into the details, except telling that the same thing was also told by our British Indian biologist J.B.S. Haldane uh, very casually when he actually wrote something on the back of a, 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 a postal cover. I will not go into the details of that. However, though we found that kin selection is happening within the Dalbergia parts, of recently in the last 10 years or 15 years, I should say, there has been an abundance of literature that shows that kin recognition happens even at the sporophytic level also. There are any number of uh, papers now in the last 15 years that we can see on that. Now, typically what all these studies do is the following. They grow an individual genotype, let us say A, as a single individual with a given amount of resource as shown by the size of this uh, square here or a block here. And, sorry, 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 sorry. Something happened. Yeah. So they, they grow a plant with a limited amount of resources, defined amount of resources, and then they double the resource and, do, and grow two individuals of the same genotype, what we call kins. But given the same level of resource, they grow the same A genotype with an another unrelated non-kin. So there are three situations here. One, an individual grown alone with defined resources, an individual grown with another of the same genotype, with the double the resources and an individual grown with an another unrelated individual with double the resources. So they compared the performance of this individual grown alone with the kins and non-kins. And what you see here is one such result. 
Now, this is the allocation into the root, fine root, that is the branching system. What you see here is where, what is the level of branching or allocation into the branching pattern in terms of resource allocated to the branching pattern when there is a single uh, or when the plant was grown alone. Whereas when it was grown along with the kin, as you can see, there is a slight decrease in the allocation to the root system. Whereas when it was grown with the non kin, there is a tremendous increase in the root allocation. That means the individual plant is competing with a non kin by producing more root system to draw more resources and thus enhance its own fitness. Whereas when it is with its own kin, it does not compete so much as it does with a non kin. Now, this kind of work has tremendously contributed to this area of kin cooperation nowadays. People have observed the behavior of plants and the root system, leaf system, stem, flowers, uh, parts, and total yield, etc. Uh, recently, we did a modest meta-analysis of all such studies, and what we have found is the following. If you compare the performance of A when it is alone with kins and non-kins, it turns out that root branching, if you think that the performance of the individual plant is, let us say, 3 plus when it is alone, when it is grown with the kins, it actually does not produce as much branching. Whereas when it grown with the uh, other non-kin, yes, in five minutes I'll be finishing, yeah. When it's grown with other non-kins, it pr pr produces profuse uh, uh, root system. Root exudates also show a similar phenomenon. On the other hand, when, oh, again, yeah, when the stem and leaf features were observed, the leaf and stem features were enhanced when grown with the kin compared to the non-kins. Thus, it appears that there is a lot of kin cooperation. And I also wanted to perhaps show how there is a mass cooperation among the plants. I will skip it. But eventually, it turns out that not only plants behave, they exhibit conflicts, they also cooperate. But I'll show you a final slide about how plants also communicate. This has been perhaps very frequently now known to all of you because it has come in uh, general uh, in a public literature abundantly. It has been shown that plants attacked by aphids warn their neighboring plants through the mycorrhiza, through the root system and mycorrhiza. Whereas plants fed upon by herbivores such as zebra warn the neighbors by producing specific volatiles so that they go on the inside production of anti-feeding chemicals by the neighboring plants. Similarly, plants that are experiencing moisture stress warn the neighbors by root exudates. Now, all this kind of plant communication has been shown up recently and most of you would know. In other words, it does appear that plants do behave, they show conflicts, they show cooperation, and they do communicate. In fact, plants also can talk to each other. So, in other words, evolution does not seem to have differentiated between plants and animals. As I told, it does not know plants, I mean, botany and zoology. It does not differentiate uh, botany and zoology. It shapes all individuals as one. And in this context, we can perhaps pay our respects back to that last uh, fight that J.C. Bose was trying to now do with the Westerners. We really try to show that plants also can feel pain. They also can understand affection. I will stop here and thank you very much. Exit, exit the slide share, please. Yeah, you'll have to exit the slide share. I have to exit. Again, I have to now do the exercise here. Uh, what do I do? Stop share. Go to no, but I, I had to still get back to that screen. I don't know where that screen is now. You, you, I think minimized it. It must be down there. You minimized it. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm not getting it. Expand. We can yes. have the questions anyway. We can have the questions. Yes. Okay. So. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Professor Ganesha. Bravo. Wow. That that was that that was great. So uh, you tell us that plants uh, do think, they can communicate, they can feel, they can respond, and at times when necessary, they can be violent as well. So that much for non-violent uh, plant 
plant sciences, plant life. Uh, uh, so at the same time, you did tell us that there is cooperation uh, in terms of altruism, which is uh, uh, quite prevalent in biological world. Thank you for this excellent talk. Uh, so may I invite questions if uh, people have, I would, yeah, you, you may go one by one. Yeah, please go ahead with your questions. Can I, this is Chandrima again. Yeah, 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 please go ahead, Chandrima. Yes, uh, yes Chandrima. This uh, altruism that you are speaking about, is it true in case of brood parasites in the birds? Yes. Because you're yes. showing this uh, little birds, you know, clamoring for food. So if there is a brood yeah. parasite inside, what do they do? What do, does the mother do? Say it again. I didn't get your point. You see, the uh, the mother will feed yeah. uh, feed them equally, right? It tries to. It it it, it it's, it's interest is to feed equally, but they do compete always. Yeah. So if you have a brood parasite, meaning that if you have a egg from a different bird, like it happens with the crows. Okay. And, so what okay, happens okay. in this case? Is that altruism? Yeah, yeah. The, the brood parasite has so nicely camouflaged that it is cheating the mother. Mother cannot really differentiate. Oh, I see. So yeah. Hmm. Any any other question, please? Please go ahead. Yeah, I have a question, Devang here. Yeah. I was just wondering, you know, what is the how does it uh, help the fitness of the plant uh, to have all four uh, seeds in the seed pod or have more seeds in the seed pod as compared to uh, just one because one seems to disperse more so maybe it's a cooperative thing where both are both fitness increases for both the seed as yeah. well as the plant see the inclusive fitness theory which I told I will not go into the details tells you that an individual can increase its fitness by making its own copies, you know, uh, several of its copies. When the dispersal is affected, when there are three seeds, but all the three of them are genetically so similar that there are three copies of them. And even if they now survive with little lesser advantage of dispersal, together their total inclusive fitness will be higher compared to when uh, they don't, you know, when they don't favor each other. That is the idea here. They compete when they genetically are unrelated. They cooperate when genetically are related because by cooperating together, they are multiplying their own genes. That is, they are selfish in other words. So the so-called altruistic, altruistic behavior that we say altruistic is actually not altruistic. They're helping each other so that their own copies can increase to that extent they're actually selfish. So there is a compensation here for the dispersal loss with the genetic copies that they are now uh, making to survive. Okay, thank you. Dr. Ganeshaya, Shubhra here. Uh, so, yeah. nice talk. Uh, I just was wondering, in one of your almost last slide, you showed that if there is a root and root exudate, so then when yeah. they are with the kin, they are performing less. When they are non-kin, performing more. However, yeah. when it is stem, that is above ground, it is just opposite. So, what is, what is this? Is there any relation with the light or, or why this? opposite behavior very very interesting in fact there are a number of studies uh, shubra in fact whenever the kins are growing they also avoid each other shading you know this is also shown number one number two you know whenever the allocation to the roots is reduced the allocation to the stem increases so they have more stem weight because of that they're not competing at the root zone when the non-kin is there they have to compete they allocate a lot of resources to the root and so the stem weight goes down so it's uh, primarily determined by the source to sink ratio in some sense and also by the shading effect as you rightly told also okay. in maize they have done one interesting study they have grown all kins and non-kins they have found that whenever the kins are grown they try to avoid each other in shading so that each of them gets better uh, solar uh, radiation okay very interesting studies are coming in the last five ten years Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Meva. Uh, Ganesha, uh, have you ever observed uh, differences in parent offspring conflict in relation to the age of the plant? You see, the plant, when it just starts reproducing, it puts some reproductive effort, and the parental investment has to continue for a long time. 
So the conflict is expected to be more. See, when the plant is very old, it doesn't have to invest any more in uh, the future generation or future offspring. It is expected that the parent offspring conflict would be less. Have you seen uh, this conflict in relation to the age of the plant? Uh, you know, Meva, there are these studies in the human beings of the weaning conflict. The parent offspring conflict happens in the weaning conflict also. There is a study which I can't recall exactly, but I can now uh, perhaps uh, help you in finding it out. They have shown that the tolerance of the mother to feed the offspring goes on increasing with the age of the mother. In the very early age, because she has to invest in further offspring, within six to eight months, she wants to now wean away the offspring, especially in monkeys. Whereas as the monkey is older, it tolerates the baby even up to almost you know one year. So no, it is recorded by it is recorded in our studies already. Precisely. In plants, no, we have not observed any such thing, but I'm I'm sure, you know, if it is true for uh, monkeys, you are right. The argument should go for the plants also, but unfortunately, no data on that. Okay, okay. Yeah. Any more questions? <clears throat> All right. If there are no more questions, I must thank the speakers, Professor Sukumar and Professor Ganeshaya for their excellent talks and also um, our colleagues who have uh, graciously attended. Uh, I'm grateful to you all, uh, to the speakers as well as the participants. So we have finished on the dot absolutely to the T. So thank you all for being here uh, this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All of you. Aditi, now we have a break, right?